There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will die till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. There's not a now that he gets not near us. No, not one, no, not one. No night so dark that his love can't cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, no, not one. I've never seen him refuse a sinner. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend, I tell you, there's not a friend. There's not a friend. No, not one, I tell you, no, not one. Sounded all over this land, and all those who believe have been given a chance to bring light where there's darkness. We have been called to bring hope where there's need, defending the helpless, protecting the weak is God's plan. So we must let it be known. Let it be said with all our hearts that we will live for Christ alone. And we will give our lives to let it be known. I know there are those who would silence the name we would share, yet we see a need for truth everywhere so with courage we'll answer with mercy and faith proclaiming the good news of Jesus today for that's what the world needs to hear again we must let it be known who we are let it be said with all our hearts that we Lord, 
stand in the midst of a multitude of those from every tribe and tongue. We are your children, redeemed by your blood, rescued from death by your love. There are no words good enough to thank you. There are no words to express my praise. But I will lift up my voice and sing from my heart with all of my strength. To the Lamb, Alleluia, Alleluia, by the blood of Christ we stand. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land, giving glory, giving honor, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. stand together if you will. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. First, second, and third verses. Let's all sing. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, seated tonight. I appreciate that great song, and I'm reminded that uh, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and I believe that is the Lord, Jesus Christ, and uh, there's a lot of friends, and of course we mentioned it, I believe, on Sunday uh, through one of the messages on Sunday, but uh, we have friends, um, and those of those of us who are uh, in, in uh, I guess, later 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s plus, you understand this, and, and, uh, but I think it takes some time that friends come and friends go. And, uh, and some friends that you'll meet in school and you'll think, well, this is going to be my BFF, you know, my best friend forever, whatever. And, uh, and, then, and then they move. And then I remember going to school with the uh, elementary school with a young man, and he moved to Alaska. And that was, uh, I think his dad was in the military. And and um, and I think that was in fourth or fifth grade. I've never saw him since. And uh, you know, so you know, you never know. And uh, even as adults, friends come, friends go. Jesus is always the same. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And a wise Christian 
will put their confidence not in man, not in themselves, but in the Lord and the friendship and build that friendship with the Lord and um, greater than anybody else. Now, my wife is my very best friend. And um, before anybody else, I love Brother Holly. I count Brother Holly as one of my dearest friends. But my wife is first and foremost. But before that is the Lord. And because you know what? If I hadn't put God first in my life, guess what? I, my wife wouldn't have given me a chance. She was looking for a... Uh, here, this is the truth. She's looking for somebody to spiritually lead her. She was. And she said, I, you know, she's grounded spiritually. And she said, I want somebody to be... A, she didn't tell me this, but I know this. And uh, she said, I'm looking for somebody. I want somebody to lead me spiritually. And uh, she, she's, and then God allowed me to our paths across, I believe, because we tried to both put God first in our lives. But, uh, but anyway, uh, put God first as your very best friend. You will not regret that decision. I love that song. We've, uh, that's sermon number one underway in our midweek Bible study. Welcome to Wednesday Night Church. I trust that you've had a good week. And if you're glad to be tonight here in church, say amen. And if you're thankful for air condition, would you say amen tonight? Now, today's been really nice, and so thank the Lord for that. But uh, I still am thankful for air condition. And, uh, but anyway, so good to see you tonight. And, excuse me, we want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord for his blessings tonight upon the service and uh, all the kids' ministries, teen ministry tonight. We've had a great time with outreach and uh, had a great group going out, several groups going out. And I think three, and so we're thankful for that. So let's pray for much fruit from those uh, door hangers that were left and contacts that were made that God would uh, bless through that in a great way. But let's pray together and ask God for his blessings tonight, the services. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for allowing us to assemble once again together tonight. Thank you for our church family and their commitment to be faithful, uh, Father, to your house tonight. And I know, I realize, Father, the folks have I've came straight off work um, and perhaps straight out of school to be here and to be faithful. I'm so encouraged by their faithfulness tonight. I pray that you would bless in every way tonight across the campus as teachers teach the truths and the, of the Word of God. They make those applicable to our young people. Fathers, we dive into your Word tonight and hear. And Father, the teens and just every, every area, Father, may you be honored and glorified. May there be a spiritual growth that takes place and Father, most importantly, if there's someone not saved tonight, may they trust Christ as their Savior. And Father, I pray that you bless now in a great way in the ministry tonight, and we'll trust you for great things and fruit from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Holly's coming to lead us. I want you to sing out with all your heart unto the Lord tonight as we worship him on this Wednesday night. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. We have several announcements, and I'm going to go through these quickly, but a lot of these I really want you to listen carefully. I've got several things to mention, and I know folks are watching online as well, so listen carefully to the announcements. A lot happening. Don't forget about Sunday. Our breakfast it starts with our breakfast, 930 to 10, the Activity Center, and I want to encourage you to come and take advantage of that. And I know many of you do, and to come and be a part of that time of fellowship, free food, and enjoy that time there in the Activity Center. And then at 10 o'clock is our adult and children's Bible classes. I want to encourage you uh, to have your family in church, Dad. Amen. And Sunday school in the Bible class. And uh, that's a great time of small group uh, where you're able to share prayer requests. You know, you're not able, always able to do that 
and to just you know kind of converse and so forth on a Sunday morning. You just can't do that, but you can at the 10 o'clock hour. And, uh, and so, uh, to, uh, depending on the teacher and the class and so forth, share your prayer requests, and, uh, you know, et cetera. And I know sometimes some classes have questions. I know we do that some in our class. We don't, we don't, you can't take the whole class time, you know. You can't take, you know, you can't take the whole 45 minutes, 40 minutes to, uh, to answer questions uh, necessarily all the time because you want to teach the Word of God. There's got to be a balance there. But it's a little more laid back, of course, as you, under, as you can understand. But have a uh, dad, bring your family, uh, get, in, get involved in the Sunday school and the adult Bible classes, teen class, children's classes at 10 o'clock. Okay, then also Mary Beth and Andrew Jones are going to be with us. We're so excited about the Jones family. We love them so very much, and we're excited about them driving in, Lord willing, on Saturday and getting in here. They'll usually set up their stuff and a Saturday night, and then um, we're looking forward to them being with us the 11 o'clock service and then also the 6 o'clock service. You don't want to miss that. Raise your hand if you've never heard them before. Raise your hand. Let's be honest. Okay, several hands. And so you are in for a treat. They are some of my favorite singers, and uh, they're just down to earth, real true blue people, and uh, very, very talented. And you'll want to get some of their, their CDs and uh, flash drives, whatever they have available to listen to them in your car. And I think they have some that you can buy in apps and so forth like that. And uh, so um, uh, be mindful of those things, okay? And then also um, a couple things going on. Uh, David Gibbs, uh, who is the uh, founder and uh, uh, the president of Christian Law Association, one of our mission uh, a- agents, or not agencies, but one of our mission um ministries that we support. It's not really a missionary, but they're mission-minded in that sense that we support them on a monthly basis. He is a tremendous speaker, and he has helped uh, churches uh, for decades uh, in legal counsel and advice, and uh, churches would, every one of us benefit from them in a tremendous way. They have a team of attorneys. Can you imagine this? This is real. They, Christian attorneys. That's what they are. That's what Christian Law Association is. I know that's kind of absurd type of oxymoron statement, but that's a reality. The CLA is a Christian Law Association. They're Christian attorneys, and, um, and uh, they are a tremendous blessing to really every church in the country and have been for decades. And so he's been going to be speaking in Yadkinville at the Northwood Baptist Church, and uh, where Pastor Tim Webb is the pastor. He'll be speaking there next week, uh, Monday and Tuesday. If you would like to go, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go or not. I, I would like to, and is that's kind of just pending. If you would like to go, if you'll let me know, we'll work it out where we can take the van or something. And so just let me know about that, okay? And then also a work day. Uh, we need to have a work day. We needed this for quite a while, but I've uh, been waiting on the temperature to come down a little bit. So we're going to have a work day, Lord willing. Uh, either September 9th or the 16th. The 16th is the same day as our church picnic and cornhole tournament, but we would, be, we would work in the morning and be done, Lord willing, around lunch. Michael Cincinnati is going to take us all to Dario and buy our lunch if you come. And he just found out about that, but he's nodding his head, okay? And I'm kidding, but, um, but I don't know about lunch. But anyway, uh, we'll work in the morning till about noon. And so the 9th or the 16th, we're just going to kind of fill that out. Uh, if you've got a pressure washer, we need to bring that. If you don't have a pressure washer, we need your hands and muscles, okay? And we'll switch out things. So that's the main thing we need to do is pressure wash the whole entire property. We've got a lot of things to pressure wash and uh, all the buildings and all the uh, playground. And there's a lot. It's, it'll take uh, 20 guys from morning till lunch to get it done, to be honest with you, if we can do that. But uh, if you can let me know about that, if you'd be willing, fellas, to do that the 9th or the 16th, or perhaps ladies, if you'd like to do that, that would be helpful as well. Uh, then also, this is something I've never asked our church to do. I've never asked our church to do this, but I just, I just felt like it might be a good thing to do. And that is, um, if you would like to pray or feel led of the Lord, uh, just kind of think about uh, possibly giving our church a Google review. And I'm not asking you to give us five stars. I'm certainly not going to ask you to give us a one star. But uh, I'm not asking you to give us a five-star review. I'm simply so that when people from the outside, they get a door hanger and they say, oh, I've never heard of this church before, let me look it up. Uh, they're able to get a good understanding and a description perhaps from Google of, of how our church 
uh, is, the feel of it. And uh, maybe if you would just kind of want to kind of person, you don't have to write a three-page essay and put on there, but just maybe a, a, a two or three sentences or something, if you feel led of the Lord to do that, um, to um, just say, hey, you've been going here for X amount of time, and it's a great church. Whatever you want to do, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying if you want to do that, that way it would give the public eye an insight of the ministry here. Okay, is everybody with me? Okay, so I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying think about it, pray about it. I've never asked you to do that, but I think it would be good for us to help the public eye about what it goes on, okay? And then also Empty Nester's trip. Don't forget about that. Jeff and Nancy Cox do a great job uh, with this age group. This is ages um, uh, 50 to 65. Uh, their next trip is uh, October 20th through the 21st of the overnight trip. They're leaving on Friday, I think, and going um, to ride, ride bicycles uh, down the Virginia Creeper. When I understand, this is a cruising bike path. This is not a pedaling. Uh, you go down the mountain, and uh, so it's a really easy ride, beautiful ride. If you're interested in that, please see Jeff or Nancy Cox, and they'll fill you in on all the details for that event coming up in October, but they need to know very soon, if not already. Uh, also, um, we I would like to get, this is another thing that's kind of brand new. I'm just going to throw this out there. I might mention it again. If you're just looking to donate $1,200, I want to tell you where you can do that. Uh, so honestly, we have folks that say, hey, Pastor, do we have any needs and so forth? And uh, there's always something to do. Uh, we're, uh, you know, always something to do. We're hopefully going to get the parking lot uh, redone here very soon. Uh, but another thing is I think it would be beneficial. Uh, it's not a must, but having a third camera uh, would also help out a little bit with our uh, live streaming. A lot of people get a watch online. And for the, the live streaming helps with two ways. One, our shut-ins and people that are unable to watch the services can, can watch when they're not able to be here. Number two, people can get an insight. Uh, if they're looking for a church, they can get an insight about how the ministry is, okay? And uh, let's just be honest. If I was looking for a church, me and my family, I'm going to watch the service before I go. I'm just going to be honest. And so I think a lot of people do that. Jeslyn, you're, you're here. You told us you've been watching for a long time before they ever came. So um, I think we want to make that uh, the best we can. We have Mike does a wonderful job with the cameras and just I can't think enough. I can't say enough good about Mike. And, um, and uh, he's a blessing in that department. And he has mentioned to me uh, about having a third camera, maybe over here something where we can get a diagonal view. It would come in handy. Those are about $1,200. It would be the same ones that we have up here. We have two already. And, again, that would be kind of something additional that would be just something nice, not a have to, but something uh, that would be nice for the addition of the ministry as far as the online. Okay, so if you just have $1,200 laying around and you want to donate that, uh, let me know, okay? And then also summer ladies meeting, or you can tell Mike, okay? Uh, summer ladies meeting, sign-up sheet is in the entryway. Many of you have already signed up. I want to encourage every lady to be a part of this wonderful summer ladies meeting uh, Thursday, August 31st at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this is a great time, ladies, to invite others to come and be with you. Maybe it's your, your mom or your sister, your cousin, your niece, uh, you can bring your daughters, ladies, and I want to encourage you to be a part of this. Um, my mother-in-law will be speaking to the Bible, the study, and the devotion, and uh, you're going to have refreshments. It's going to be a wonderful time in Heritage Hall, and I want to encourage you to go ahead and sign up as soon as you can so we can have a good count of how many is coming for this time. And then also the Young Adult Fellowship Kayaking is next Saturday, and we're looking forward to this great time together uh, for ages 19 to 49. And uh, I think there's four or five families coming. Uh, some have signed up, some have let me know. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to it, my wife and I, and we would love for you to join us. It's going to be a beautiful trip, Lord willing, uh, down the New River in Todd. And so it's about an hour, hour and a half or so. If you want to go, I need you to sign up, please, by or before Sunday. Okay, so keep that in mind, if you will. And then also the diaper drop-off. Thank you so much for, to many of you have, who have dropped off diapers um, over here already for Ashley and Ricky Phillips. I know they're uh, going to be blessed by that. And uh, the deadline for that is this coming Sunday, the 20th. So please be mindful of that to get that in on the time frame. And appreciate Miss Scarlett heading that up, doing such a good job with the wedding showers, the baby showers, the diaper drop off. She handles all of that, does a phenomenal job. And I, think, I can't thank her enough for that. Okay. All right. Brother Holly, you come. Let's all stand together once again. All over the building tonight, we're going to stand, sing out unto the Lord with all of our hearts as we worship together. And then during the interlude, I want you to leave your seats, go to someone, shake their hand, greet them tonight in the house of the Lord. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and come forgive. Yeah. 
Take time, fellowship. Teenagers are dismissed. Second and fourth verses together. I want you to sing this with us tonight. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations ran you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name. a good job of their singing, doesn't he? And we thank the Lord for him uh, constantly and uh, all that he does in every area. We want to receive our offering tonight. Ushers, you come at this time, please. And uh, I want to thank you for your giving. And tonight, the offering goes to what, church? Missions. And let's be faithful to the missions program tonight. And, uh, and uh, we're thankful for the missionaries we have. And God is blessed and uh, was in contact with one of our missionaries, Ken Beckley. Uh, today, uh, and uh, he's going to be with us, Lord, we, Lord willing, we're in the process of scheduling it for next year. Uh, he'll be back in the States and giving us an update about how God's do, what do, God's doing in his life, and we're looking forward to meeting him and, and seeing him, all right? But uh, let's pray for all of our missionaries so you can get a glimpse of what they're doing uh, in the missions hallway back in the educational building, and I want to encourage you to see those from time to time, all right? Let's pray and ask God for his blessings tonight. Jeff Cox, would you just right there pray for us tonight? Amen. You can be seated.
much instrumentalist, thanks to him. Is that the correct uh, name of that song? I appreciate that. I'll never be the same. Oh, let's just praise the Lord. I did get it wrong. Well, I knew it was a good song. Exodus chapter 20 in your Bibles tonight. Exodus chapter number 20. I want to show off this trophy tonight. And uh, this is not one I've got. This is a one to give away, okay? And so it's Temple Baptist Church 2023 Cornhole Tournament winner. Uh, can we do the oohs and ahs now at this time, okay? Very good, okay. You're, done, you're doing well. Uh, so I'm excited about our Cornhole Tournament. We've been doing this now for two or three years at, and, and coincide this with our church picnic. We started off doing this a couple years ago, two, three, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago. Uh, maybe it's been that long. And um, we started at a, at a picnic shelter, kind of a Winston-Salem Park nearby. And uh, it was great. It, we had a great time with that. But we, then we moved it here, and we've been doing it here for the last two or three years. And it's just, it's a, it's a great time. It's a good, big turnout. And it's a church-wide event. It's a great way to fellowship and just have a hot dog and hamburger free, no charge. And, um, and just, just enjoy some great time of fellowship. And the cornhole tournament starts at 5 o'clock. The sign-up sheet is in the entryway. We've already got that out. It's about four and a half weeks to the tournament. But I want to encourage you to go ahead and think about getting a partner and, uh, and a partner up, write you and your partner down. If you can bring a cornhole tournament, of course, or excuse me, if you can bring a cornhole uh, game set, we need those. And so if you could circle your name, I think that's what it says on the sign-up sheet. If you could circle your name, that you could bring a cornhole set, that would be great. Okay, and then that way we know how much, how many we, we have available. And, uh, and then, so go ahead and sign that up, and um, I'm looking forward to that. Caleb Taylor's heading up the game, and he'll have the bracket and all of that. He'll put all that together. And, um, but I uh, just wanted to show you the trophy, okay? And uh, so I'm excited about that. Who won last year? Does anybody remember? Mike and Elizabeth Holly. Okay, and so they were a team, hus hus husband and wife team. And so congrats to them last year. So we're excited about this year and looking forward to that. And then also just another quick note there on that. If you want to bring something, the church does the hot dogs and hamburgers. And we grill that out and here and all that. And uh, you don't have to bring any of that. But if you want to bring stuff like chili, onions, cheese, lettuce, tomato, that kind of thing, there's a sign-up sheet for that in the entryway as well. So help us out with that if you can. Exodus chapter 20. And let's look in verse number 1. Exodus chapter 20, in verse number 1 tonight, we're going to be reading down through verse number 17. And of course, if you're familiar with your Bible, um, this is the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter number 20, where God gave to Moses. And we're going to be reading these as a springboard of particularly one uh, that we're going to read in verse 17 is going to be our basis for our message and our thought tonight in this series of drifting. Uh, and, of course, the, to the topic tonight in our series of drifting is coveting. And so I believe that this is a big thing that can cause us to drift away from the Lord. And I don't know how much further we'll go with this, this series. We, this may be the last night of it. We may go one more. We'll just pray about that as the Lord leads. But... Um, I've enjoyed this series. It's kind of been kind of a warning type of series. I, 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 you know, I think it's good to do that. The, there's warnings all throughout the Word of God. And, uh, but uh, we're just going to pray about that. But um, it won't be too much longer, perhaps. But I, I thought it would be good to read all these Ten Commandments, be familiar with them in our Bibles. Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 1. The Bible says, In God... Spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Well, right there's the reason for keeping the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Because God had delivered them. And Christianity, as a side note, Christianity should never be a, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do God's word. It should be, I get to do what God has asked me to because God has saved me. God has delivered me from sin and hell. And so I get to please the Lord by his, by his standard found in the Word of God. And that was the basis for what Israel, why they were to keep the commandments, was because God had delivered them. Isn't it interesting how God has a purpose and a plan 
just for everything. I mean, it's just amazing. But let's continue reading verse number 3. Here we go. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. By the way, gods can be golf clubs. And gods can be I don't, shoes for ladies. I don't know if you like shoes. Gods can be any cars, whatever. Gods can be money. Okay. Verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You say, whoa, 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 what was that about being jealous? Well, God wants us to worship him and him alone, not any other God, because of what he's done for us, okay? Uh, look in verse number, it's a good, it's a righteous jealousy, it's a, it's a holy jealousy, because God is holy. Verse number six, and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do, not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all them... Uh, that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Verse 16, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. In verse 18, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. So let's talk tonight specifically regarding this commandment. And we, un we understand that we are not bound to the Old Testament law, right? We have liberty as New Testament Christians. The cross is what made the difference, amen? So we're not bound to law, but we are to... Use the Word of God. The Bible teaches us that the Old Testament was written for our learning. And so we, should, we would be very wise to heed to these commandments. Although, uh, for example, we don't worship the Lord on Saturday. We worship the Lord on Sunday. That's something that's changed because why? The resurrection happened the first day of the week on Sunday. And so there, we're not bound to hold to the entire law, but we're to use it and learn from it in a practical and wise way uh, God has given it to his people. We would be wise to, in, 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 uh, to take heed of that. But let's look at verse number 17 specifically tonight about coveting. Let's pray. And we'll get into this thought tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word tonight. And I pray that you give me clarity of thought in mind and use me to be a blessing to our church family tonight, whether they're here or whether they're watching online. And I pray that we would take heed to it, apply it, implement it to our lives and grow spiritually. Father, help me. Use me, please. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've said that there are, of course, many different uh, situations uh, where a believer uh, figuratively drifts away from God, which ultimately causes them to no longer serve the Lord. And we could all give uh, examples of how we knew someone at some point who served the Lord. They were in church every time the doors were open. They were serving in some type of capacity and slowly... It didn't happen overnight, although those are, there's some scenarios like that, but slowly they drift away from God. And now no longer are they even in church at all. They may claim to be saved, but they just are not living for the Lord in any, in any way. And our hearts are broken for them when we pray for them. We all have people, perhaps even family like that. Uh, that have drifted away from God. And the best thing we can do is just be a godly Christian testimony in front of them and pray for them and look for God to open a door to, for us to be a help to them. But we want to be careful uh, to, to, to drift away uh, from the Lord. We can't lose our salvation, as we said, uh, but we can drift in our fellowship with the Lord. And uh, tonight, again, we're talking about coveting. And as an individual begins coveting, uh, it will no doubt draw their heart away from the Lord. 
What is coveting? Well, I think most of us could uh, or know what that means, but just for sake of understanding tonight, coveting, there's, you can use several different definitions and wordings, and they would really all be probably pretty correct. But just a simple definition here is to lust for or desire to obtain something that is not mine. Okay, So it's wanting, back in verse number 17 uh, in the Ten Commandments, God said, don't covet. Don't try to get a wife that doesn't belong to you. Don't try to get uh, a manservant or maidservant or somebody's cow that doesn't belong to you. Somebody's house. In other words, we're not to drive down the road and see a house and say, I wish that was mine. Or see somebody's wife or husband and say, I wish they were mine. Or somebody's car and say, I wish that was mine. So God says, don't do that in verse number 17 of Exodus chapter 20. Now, there are mentions of positive form of covet in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31 is a good example. The Bible says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. So, so, so some, maybe just one or two, there's, there's in the New Testament particularly, there's, there's areas where it says, God says, I want you to covet. In other words, I want you to long after this good thing, okay? And the way you discern that and tell the difference between a positive way of coveting and a negative is by the scripture, the wording around what it's talking about. If God says, I want you to covet after, uh, after spiritual gifts, it is obvious it is a good thing to want that, to desire that. But here, I think we would all agree, in the Ten Commandments, it falls under thou shalt not, right? Amen. It is a negative coveting. It is don't do it, God says, okay? And um, I want you to notice there's three things about coveting to tonight and how if we're not careful, we can, even solid, stable Christians can drift away, uh, away from the Lord with this, uh, with this enticement here if it gets into our hearts. Now, notice number one, and this is really simple. Notice number one, the command regarding coveting. The command. We have the command first right here in the, in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, verse number 17. The, old, the command here in the Old Testament. Look at it again, and, and, and we're going to move on from here. But look at it one more time. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is, in, that is thy neighbor. In other words, this covers everything. If somebody has something that you, have, that you, uh, that you don't have, don't covet after that. Don't, don't lust after that and try to obtain that uh, at, with that mindset and those feelings. And so there's the command in the Old Testament. But let's move on into the New Testament. Uh, there's also the command in the New Testament. Now, I'm gonna, you can turn there if you want to, but Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 5, we find covetousness. In Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5, uh, the Bible says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What does that mean? Mortify your members? Does that mean we're to take our church members and, and do away with it? No! Sometimes the Bible talks about members. It's talking about your ears and your tongue and your eyes and your fingers, your members of your body, okay? Again, rightly dividing that, but discerning what the chapter, the verses is talking about. And so here it's talking about mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. In other words, you're, watch out what your eyes are doing, what your heart's going. Be careful what your mind is thinking on. Be careful where your feet are taking you. Mortify Therefore, your members, in other words, deaden them. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. Here we go. Here's the list. We're to die to. We're not to do these things. Fornication. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. And covetousness. And it goes on to say, which is idolatry. So God says, here's the command. Not only in the Old Testament, in our Ten Commandments, don't covet. Don't lust after something that doesn't belong to you. And then here in the New Testament we have it, and there's just one example of really many things that we could give of, of a negative uh, way that coveting is mentioned. Don't do it in other words. But I want you to notice and I want you to listen 
the other terms and words that covetousness is mentioned with. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, or, which is lusting, a form of it, and covetous, covetousness. So understand the, 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 what is characterized with. Uh, and so we should not want anything to do with coveting. And I want us to notice not only what co coveting is listed with in, in the New Testament, Colossians 3, 5, but also what covetousness is. Colossians 3, 5 says it is idolatry, which is idol worship. And so God is basic, God is, could not say it clear, more clear what uh, we are to do about this thing of coveting. God says in the Old Testament and the New Testament, don't do it. Don't do it. Now let's look at the next point, number two tonight. And I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to deal with the consequences of coveting. I, I don't think any of us, can, we, we, we're not going to debate on the God's command of, of don't coveting. But what are the consequences of it? Well, one, there's two consequences that I want us to look at tonight. And the first one is in Matthew chapter 6. I want us to look at that. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 25. Coveting draws our hearts away from the Savior. Coveting, when we do so, draws our hearts away from the Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 6. Are you there? If you're there, say amen. All right, Matthew, I'm getting there. All right, Matthew chapter 6, and verse number 25. The Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. Now this is Jesus talking, right, in his earthly ministry. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Isn't that something, it's not even the message, but isn't that something to think upon? The birds have food, and God provides it for them. As a matter of fact, all, all the animals, God provides for them. Isn't that interesting? Your father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? God said, I made the creatures in the sea and the air and the field. But I made man in my own image. And I gave man dominion over the animal world. I'm not against animals. I love animals. We've got two at our home. And uh, I love, no, we've got more than that. Ollie is our beloved hamster. He's number three. When we have debates in our home of how Micah, my son and I, are totally outnumbered with three girls in the house, we always bring up Ollie. And I'll say, Micah, we're outnumbered with all these three girls, aren't we? And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Micah says, yeah, yeah, we're, you know, we're in trouble. We're out. And Joanna says, yeah, but y'all got Ollie. You know, but then if you count that, then we got two girl dogs. So we're really outnumbered at that. But, uh, but Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, which of you, verse 27, Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. God gives us another illustration to consider of nature. Think about the birds. God provides for them. Think about the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toll not, neither do they spin. In other words, they're formed and fashioned so beautifully, and there's structure to them. And, and they're, of course, some, you, you can mow them down, of course, but if you think of a, just a wild flower, it's just so beautiful out in the middle of a field. God has made that, and it says, don't just spin around. It's got structure to it. God formed that precisely. Verse 29, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. In other words, one day God's going to judge the, wor or, uh, the world, of course, by fire uh, in the tribulation period. Shall he not much more clothe you, all ye of little faith? Verse 31, Jesus says, therefore take no thought... 
don't worry. Don't be concerned. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or with all shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. I love the song. I don't know about tomorrow, you know. But I know who holds my hand. Amen. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Look back in verse number 33. So Jesus says, think about the birds, think about the, the, the lilies of the field. God says, I made them, I've provided for them, I've made them precisely, exactly. And, and I don't want you to worry about your life because God says, I'm in control. And just like I'm providing for those birds and just like I provided and made... Uh, created those lilies of the field, I can take care of you. God can take care of us, can he? But notice again, he says in verse number 33, but seek ye first. There's people, and you and I as Christians, seek stuff for ourselves, right? We, we want food, we want clothing, we want homes, we want cars, we want this and we want this, and we want all of these different things in our life. But if we are not careful... We will get to the point where things get out of perspective. Things get out of priority. And I begin, instead of verse 33, seeking first the kingdom of God and allowing God to provide the things that I need, I began stepping over God, in a sense, if you will, and saying, Lord, I know that you'll provide, but I'm just going to go ahead and do this myself. And instead of trusting in the Lord, we begin Here's our word, coveting. I need this. I want that. I want so-and-so's got this. I want that. Instead of seeking the Lord and His righteousness and trusting God, it goes back to our point, coveting. Is everybody with me tonight? Coveting draws our hearts away from the Savior. In coveting, we desire to have things instead of trusting God to provide those needs. I'm not against saving and buying big things and investments. I'm not against that. I think that's very wise. I think we ought to do those things. But I'm simply saying in the area of coveting, when we get our priorities out of order, when we are not trusting and being dependent upon the Lord and we begin coveting and seeking our own benefit and, uh, and begin coveting after other things because I don't have it and they do, so I begin Coveting, God says don't do that. So coveting, a consequence of that, draws our hearts away from the Savior. Now, notice the next thing, and I really want you to turn. Uh, maybe you didn't turn to Matthew chapter 6, but I really want you to turn to this one. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. So Joshua chapter 6 and verse number 16. And um, we're going to look at coveting and how it drives us to practice sin. So coveting, what are the consequences of it? Well, one, it draws our hearts away from the Lord when we do it. Secondly, coveting drives us to practice sin. And I think the verse is here, because we're going to turn to a couple. They're up here. So Joshua chapter 6, and I'm turning with you. Joshua chapter number 6. And verse number 16. So Joshua chapter number 6 is the... Famous battle of Jericho, right? We love reading about Jericho and the walls and how they tumbled down. So let's begin reading verse number 16. So they're at Jericho. God's given them instructions about what to do, right? You march around the city and uh, uh, once a day for seven days. On the seventh day, you march around for seven times. And then, and then after that, you, you blow the trumpets and you shout... And God's going to give the victory. And God did. In verse 16, we're picking up where Joshua, the commanding general of the army of Israel, is giving the instructions about what Israel is to do regarding the fall of Jericho, the city, and the walls. Look in verse number 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew... Uh, Please move the trumpet. Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Now, verse number 17, and the city shall be what? Accursed. Even it and all that are therein to the Lord. 
Only Rahab. Does anybody remember Rahab? The harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing. What is the accursed? We're going to find out. Of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver, verse 19, and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So stop reading there. So, so Joshua is telling them what God has told Joshua. He said, listen, you leave this stuff alone. And some of this stuff, we're going to dedicate it to the Lord, okay? And so, but you don't touch it. You leave it alone. Because if you do, you're going to cause the whole camp to, to have to uh, deal with the chastening hand of the Lord. The whole camp of Israel is going to have a curse upon it because of one individual doing wrong. Now, look at verse number, chapter 7 of verse number 1. Here we get introduced to a man named Achan. Verse number 1 of chapter 7. Is everybody with me? Say amen if you're awake, if you're alive. Okay. Verse number 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the cursed thing. For Achan, the son of Karma, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. Whoa! Joshua just said, don't take of the accursed thing. Don't take of these gold and silver and all the clothing you're going to see. It's going to be, they're, going to, they're really wealthy folks and we're going to take the whole city. God's going to give it to us, but don't, don't mess with it. Remember what God told them already in Exodus chapter 20. They had it on the table of stone. Don't covet. Look what they did. Look what he did of the tribe of Judah took of the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Well, can I just be honest with you? Nobody saw it, but God did. You say, well, nobody sees what's on my phone. God knows exactly what's on your phone. Nobody knows what's in my closet. God knows exactly what's in your closet. We don't find anything for the Lord. You can't hide your thoughts from the Lord, our hearts from the Lord. Nothing. God sees everything. Now, skip over in verse number 19. Because guess what? Be sure, everybody say this with me if you know it. Be sure your sin will find you out. And Achan learned it the hard way. Verse number 19, and Joshua said unto Achan, fast, we're fast forwarding the whole section here. What happened was, you can read it when you get home. What happened was their next battle after Jericho, everybody's like, woohoo, Jericho's fallen. We are victory. This is the first victory of the, of the nation of Israel as an as a army. They, w- they didn't know anything about soldiering, army, nothing. They were slaves. And so God brought them out, and now God says, now you're going to be an army. And they didn't know nothing, but God was doing it through them and for them when they were obedient to the Lord and His Word. And th- then after that, they're like, yeah, praise the Lord. And so then they go to the next battle, which is a little town called Ai, Ai. And Joshua sends the, 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 some of the army uh, <clears throat> personnel on up, and he says, let me know what, how many people we need to send to Ai. They got back, and they're like, this is a piece of cake. We got this. They're nothing. We don't have to send a whole lot of people, just a few. So Joshua said, sounds good. Just send a few. Well, they sent a few to, to up there to take Ai, and Ai just took them out. And they came back, and they were so disheartened, discouraged. And they were like, what has happened? We just defeated Jericho by the help of the Lord, but now we can't defeat this little place called Ai? What is happening? And God says it's because there's sin in your camp. And I'm not going to bless you when you got sin in your life, in the camp. So they put on the search, and here we find in verse number 19. Everybody look in verse number 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, because they found that it was Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And verse 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, 
and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. When I what? Coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth. He thought they were hid. He put them underneath his tent. Nobody saw it. I don't even know if his wife knew it. Look in verse number, hid, hid, hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And we'll stop reading there um, because they found out it was true what he was saying. So he hid this. He, when they were raiding Jericho and, and destroying the city, he, found, he found this garment, he found this gold and silver and so forth, and he took it and he hid it, put it in his tent, in his home in other words, and God knew it, nobody else did, and God said, I'm not going to continue giving you victory because you got sin. They found out it was Achan, he confessed to it, and he said, because I coveted after that. We're talking about consequences of coveting. Not only does it draw our hearts away from the Savior, but coveting drives us to practice sin. What kind of sin? Well, stealing. Stealing. What about stealing somebody else's spouse? Stealing. What about stealing something that doesn't belong to you? And it leads to that. You say, well, I would never steal. Are you, are you, I'm not asking you, are you on second base? I'm asking you, are you on first base? Are you on the coveting base? Because I believe the stealing happens will come after the coveting takes place. And so the coveting, it, 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 it not only drives us away from the Lord, but it causes us to sin. And stealing is what Achan did because he was coveting. And coveting cannot only lead to stealing. You say, Pastor, I would never do that. Well, what about this one? And we're going to move on to the last point. What about sinful thoughts? What about sinful thoughts? Let me give you a verse. Romans chapter 8, verse number 6 and 7. The Bible says, for to be carnally minded. You know, you can be, we can be spiritually minded and we can be, or we can be carnally minded. What does that mean? Carnally minded means to be carnal, not spiritual. I can have good spiritual right thoughts or I can have nasty, fleshly, ungodly, unholy, bad thoughts. Right? In, in every area. For to be carnally minded is death. What does that mean? I believe it means spiritually death. If you and I have a carnal mind, you are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are carnal Christians. We're not going to get much done for the Lord, are we? Because of our carnal mind. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So not only can coveting, one, draws our hearts from the Savior because we fail to trust Him, but coveting drives us to practice sin. Now I don't think these are things that, I don't know if we're tempted about these. These are kind of the big, bad problems here. But coveting drives us to practice sin and, uh, by stealing and perhaps sinful thoughts. Now, notice the third thing. Notice the third thing. And that is the last thing, and that is the cure. What is the cure for coveting? Have you ever had this, don't raise your hand, don't say amen, have you ever had this slight inclination of coveting something uh, that somebody else had? You ever had that, that's between you and the Lord, but have you ever had that slight, you never stole, you wouldn't even categorize it as a sinful fault, but in your heart and mind as a, child of God and somebody that wants to please the Lord with all your heart, you say in your heart and mind, I want to stay away from that as far as I can. I don't want anything to do with a covetous mindset or heart or passion. I want to stay away from that pastor as much as I can. And I believe that's everybody here tonight. So what is the cure? What is the, uh, what is the antidote? What is the help for, for having this temptation of coveting? So let's look at three things and we're done. The first one, the first cure for coveting is contentment. Just simply being content. You don't have to turn, but I'm going to read to you Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. The Bible says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of Walt... Paul said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, a lot of us, 
are trying to learn that. Because we want this and that, and if we're not careful, that can easily drift into coveting. And so the greatest way to combat that, the cure for that, is to simply be content. Paul said, in whatsoever state I am, I'm just learn to be content. He says, I both know, I know both how to be abased, in other words, to be brought low, and I know how to abound everywhere, and in all things I am struggling both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And so may we be content with what we have. Just be content. And <laughs> sometimes that's hard to do. Especially when the Joneses or the whoever have, I'm trying to think, I, hope, I don't think there's no Joneses in our church. I, don't, I would be terrified, horrified if I use somebody's example. If, if um, I better quit doing that. If the so-and-so had the new boat, you know, we're, we're tempted to, you know, we're just tempted not to be content, right? Mm, honey, they got a boat. They got a new car, you know. And so we struggle with that sometimes as godly Christians because our mind sometimes gets on the material things. And we, we fail to be content with what God has blessed us with. But that is the cure, the first cure for coveting. What is the second cure? I'm glad you asked. The second cure is thankfulness. Being thankful for what you have. Being thankful for what we have. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you're called in one body. And be ye thankful. Not only is the cure for being covetous uh, to be content with what God has blessed us with. Whether it's cheese and crackers or whether it's T-bone steak. I mean, whatever you have. Be content with it. But also be thankful for what you have. Can I encourage you with something? Write down a list. Have it on a 3 by 5 card, a 5 by 8 card, 8 by 11 What? It doesn't matter what you use a poster board. It don't matter to me. Use your dry erase board at home. Have a list. Maybe it's in your Bible. Maybe it's in your windowsill in the kitchen. Maybe it's at your workplace in your toolbox. Whatever it is, have a list set up of things you are thankful for. And thank God for that list and name them by name, those that you've wrote down on that list on a daily basis. Well, I'm thankful for my wife. Thank you, Lord, for my wife. Thank you, Lord, for my children. Thank you, Lord, for my parents. Thank you, Lord, for my church. Thank you, Lord, for my... Pa yeah, thank you, Lord, for my pastor. Thank you, Lord, for my, my job. Lord, if it's your will, I sure would love to get a, a pay raise, but I'm going to be content until that, open, that door opens. Lord, you know I might need another job, but Lord, I'm thankful for the one you gave me now. Lord, I, want you, uh, Lord, I, I would love for you to open up another door, but I'm going to be content, and I want to be thankful for the one you gave me currently. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for that. And do that list, and that will produce so many things in your heart. It will produce a spirit of gratitude and thankfulness. You ever been around somebody that was thankful? And then in comparison, have you ever been around somebody who was unthankful? There's a total different spirit about that individual. The unthankful person is grouchy as can be, and let's just be honest, nobody wants to be around them. But thankful people, wow, I love being around thankful people. They're thankful. Hey, praise the Lord, the light turned green. Amen. They're thankful. I have to work on that. What is the third one? And this is the last one, and we're done. The third cure for coveting is dependency. Not only is being content, but, and by the way, godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. But the second cure for coveting is thankfulness, and the third cure for coveting is dependency. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. <laughs> Sometimes we just need to have this mindset. Lord, if you want me to have it, I'm going to work for it. And I'm going I'm to ask you for it because you said ask it. It should be given. And Lord, I'm going to ask you for this, but I'm not going to covet. And I'm going to depend upon you to meet every need. 
And I'm Matthew 6, 33, Lord, I'm going to seek you first. And I'm going to put my tithe in first. I'm going to put you in my priority first. I'm going to put you first in every aspect of life I can. And Lord, I may not ever get a new boat, but I want my heart to be right with you. Lord, if you see fit to bless me with this and bless me with this and bless me with this, I'm going to thank you and praise you. But if you don't, I'm still going to thank you and praise you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight. I realize that you're, I, I believe with all my heart this is a very spiritual church. A spirit of revival is here, and I thank God for that. And it's not because of the block wall. It's not because of the, 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 the instruments. It's not because of the pulpit. It is a spirit of revival because the people that abide within it and your heart makes that. And I thank God for you. But does the spirit of covetous ever swell up in your heart? Do you ever have this mindset of you're not just content exactly? May the Lord help us to be content. May the Lord help us to be satisfied by being thankful and just content with what God has blessed us with and just depend upon the Lord for every aspect of our Christian lives. Let's all stand together. Musicians are going to begin playing. The altar's open tonight. If you have a need, I don't know what it is. Maybe you just want to come and say, Lord, I just want to thank, thank you for what you've blessed me with. Lord, you've been so good to me. Whatever that need, would you find your place around the altar tonight? If you're here tonight and not saved, it will be a wonderful night of trusting Christ as your Savior tonight. Would you come? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The invitation is here as they play. Would you come tonight? love you tonight. Help us, Father, to have this spirit of contentment and thankfulness and dependency, Lord, on you. Help us never to be tempted to drift because we begin becoming covetous uh, in our hearts and minds. Father, help us in this area. I thank you for these people. Thank you for this church and their spiritual heart for you. Help us in these areas to grow continually. Lord, thank you for what you do. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you can be seated tonight. We're going to go over these um, prayer requests, and I'm going to mention these, and then we'll take outspoken prayer requests if there's any of those tonight. Let's pray for all of our shut-ins, uh, that the Lord would help all of them, and many of them are listed on the back of the bulletin, of course. Our missionaries, let's pray for our country, our military. Let's pray for Israel. Uh, let's pray for our services on Sunday. Uh, raise your hand and say, Pastor, I'm going to pray that God would be glorified in our service on Sunday, that God would meet with us and the power of God would be present and, and uh, that God would, if it would be, you know, if there was somebody not saved, they would get saved and God would just bless, fill the church. Let's, would you pray with me? Let's really pray that about that, that God would just do a great things in our church services Sunday. And uh, we have great services. I love, but I just, you know, I believe it's a result of prayer. But I just, I would love to see even more. Maybe somebody getting right with the Lord, dedicating their life to the Lord. Somebody getting saved. Uh, perhaps somebody joining the church. So many different things. I would love to see God working in, a, in a, just a tremendous way, uh, even more so. Um, but let's pray for our services. Let's pray for Miss Wanda Michaels. Let's remember her in prayer. Uh, and then also Ruby Kane, uh, Connie DePorto, Larry Smith. Let's remember him. Bonnie Smith. Betty Hale, as she's... Uh, She's still at Trinity Elms. Okay. Uh, and then Sarah Bellamy has a procedure coming up in September next month. So pray for her about that. Tootie Farrington continually it got a good report, uh, is a good report on Tuesday, on uh, Friday. And uh, so we praise the Lord for that. Um, still going to do some tests. You want to give us an update? Okay, 
Well, let's continue to pray for Tootie. And then also Lawrence Miller. Lawrence, is he's under hospice care, and uh, he, he has fell. And they've got a bed there for him, and he has fell now uh, and um, fractured his arm. And uh, so he's, he's Miss, Miss Patricia's just really having a hard time. And uh, maybe some of you ladies want to reach out to her, be a blessing. I know you have been, I'm sure, but if you want to you maybe reach out to her, text or something, and uh, they're just really going through a hard time. So pray for them. Bunny Manning's grandson, Alex. Uh, Mel- Melanie Williamson uh, with her cancer treatment. Dot Adams as well. Uh, continue to pray for Charles Petit and uh, Gary Bartling. Uh, and then also Randy Smith. Mike Smith uh, had some uh, heart situation going on. He's doing Thankful he's doing better. We thank the Lord for that. They're here tonight. Uh, Novella Moore, uh, Sarah Hawks, uh, Miss Holly's dad, continue to pray for him. Um, I think he's going to have a procedure uh, with some cancer, but thankfully it hadn't spread anywhere, and they're going to hopefully go in and have the procedure and, and take care of all of that. And then Jody Gross, his uncle, passed away uh, just the other day. And uh, so let's pray for Jody and his family with his uncle passing away. And uh, passed away, is it yesterday? Okay. And that funeral, the, the uh, viewing is Friday, uh, 6 to 8, Hayworth Miller in Rural Hall. And the, uh, the, the funeral service will be on Saturday. And uh, so if you would be able to go by, I know Jody and his family would appreciate that. So let's pray for the Gross family tonight with that passing. Okay, anybody else have a, a prayer request tonight by uplifted hand tonight? We'll start over here. Okay. Everybody's ready to go home tonight. They're like, uh, no. okay, I'm going slow. I feel like I'm going to overlook somebody. Miss Kelly? be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You have to use some discretion there. The Lord gives that, and God does open doors. All right, so let's pray for Miss Kelly and these prayer requests tonight. Anybody else over here? Okay, over here. Okay, Miss Melanie? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Miss Melanie. Let's pray for the uh, Hawaii and all the fires down there. And I, I've saw some of that. That just breaks my heart. And uh, I should have mentioned that. Thank you for mentioning that. And so let's pray for Hawaii tonight and all those people that have lost their homes and just everything with those fires. Anybody else? Okay. If you have an unspoken prayer request, would you raise your hand tonight? And so let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, and conclude the service tonight uh, with praying with all of these prayer requests tonight. Father, we love you. and we th- We're so thankful for this place. We're thankful for what it means to each one of us. And uh, Father, I pray that you would meet the needs, Father, of our church family tonight. Many just, just now raised their hands just a moment ago. Father, they have an unspoken prayer request. They have something on their heart and mind. And many times we can't mention things because they're private and they're things only you know about. Maybe not even our, our distant family or friends know about, but Lord, you know it. And I pray that you'd meet that need, those needs according to your will. Father, I pray that you'd help all the needs of our church family, the, the many prayer requests on the back of the bulletin. Uh, Father, these that we've read off tonight, I pray that you'd meet these needs. These that have outspoken prayer requests, that we've heard these, I pray that you would intervene on their behalf and answer these needs, these requests, these uh, prayer, prayer requests tonight. Father, I pray that you'd help our country, our nation. Uh, Father, our government leaders, that they would turn back to you, they would get saved. I pray for Israel, bless them, give them peace. I pray for our missionaries. Father, I pray that you'd help our, I think about the, the needs in Hawaii. My, my heart breaks sometimes. I, I, we, we, we can't realize, I guess, what, what people go through sometimes. But I pray that you'd give them help and strength. Uh, 
help them to look to you right now. And uh, Father, I pray that you bless our services on Sunday. Thank you for what you've done in this church. I think about our choir. Uh, Father, almost all the choir members, not everyone, but many of them are brand new. And they're just singing like they've been singing together for 25 years. And just doing a great job and how you're blessing there and blessing in so many areas. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and praise and thanksgiving for what you've done and what you're doing. We ask that you continue to bless and even more so in great ways. I pray that you fill this auditorium uh, with our regulars being faithful because they desire to and they have the ability to. Father, I pray that you would uh, give brand new families that will get on board in and, and this army and, and help serve and witness our labors for the harvest. And Father, I pray that you bless the preaching of your word, the singing. I pray that you be honored and glorified through everything that's said and done. There will be a, a, a true spirit of worship in a great way, in a great magnitude this Sunday. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts and lives in these requests. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all stand together. I want to thank you again for being here tonight. And uh, don't forget about all the different prayer requests, the sign-up sheets in the entryway. And I want you to turn around and smile real big. Shake two or three hands before you leave tonight. Thank one another for coming. God bless you. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.